ファミリーコンピュータの楽しいカセット情報シングルスダブルアーヴィファミコン This was Nintendo's introduction to the cartridge based home game console market, and it was met with an overwhelmingly positive reception. The truth is that so many great games were never localized for a release in English speaking regions of the world. Now, one of my favorite Famicom games that never officially made it over to the United States was an RPG by Tecmo titled Radia Senkei. Radia Senki. Tecmo. Now, without going into a full on review of this game, I'll briefly tell you why it's one of my personal favorites. First, imagine if you combined all of the good playing mechanics from games such as The Legend of Zelda, Crystallis, Secret of Mana, and you put them into one game. Well, then you would probably have Radius n k The combat mechanics are outstanding, honestly, probably some of the best that I've ever seen of its type on the original Famicom. And that fantastic combat system is equally met with a beautiful, compelling story that is full of detail and exposition from the beginning of the game all the way to the end. Seriously, I don't even know how they fit all this into a 2 megabit program memory. Fortunately, this game received a fantastic translation that allows English speaking gamers the ability to play through it. Now, today, we're going to convert the original Radius n k Famicom cartridge into an English playable version of the game. Sit back. Strap on and let's make it happen. So, the question has always been how in the hell do we take apart a Famicom cartridge that has absolutely no visible screws or fasteners that hold the two halves of plastic together? Well, let's look at a broken down Famicom cart and investigate this just a bit. Now, this is a copy of Dragon Quest IV, and as you can see, I've disassembled this cartridge. Now, the way that most Famicom carts work is that they have these. Enter tabs on each side of one of the sides. And the bottom tab, or the bottom half, just has these little indentations that are designed to interface and lock with these tabs. As you can see, if I get a nice side shot here, you can see the hook. It simply hooks in to, to the plastic, anchoring these pieces together. So, what we need to do is we need to create some compression. We need to create some compression so that we can slightly bend these down. So that we can easily, and without disturbing the, the, the cartridge or harming the cartridge, we can easily deface these. So, in order to do that, we're gonna need one simple tool. Now, the brand doesn't matter, but it's a quick grip. Like I said, don't mind the brand. But I do recommend that you do get this pistol grip、um, sort of configuration because this is actually really easy to work with. It gives you plenty of room to get the cartridge in here, and it gives you plenty of room to manipulate things so you can do this very, very safely and very cleanly. So, let me show you how I do this. Now, before I get started, what I like to do is I like to take my quick grip and I just like to size it down to the width of the cartridge. It's exactly what I've done here. It just saves time and it makes things easier when you're making those sort of fine tuned adjustments. Now, I want to take the cartridge and I want to pick it up. I want to make sure the front face faces me. I'm going to turn it on its side so I can see the separation between the bottom and the top halves of the plastics. Now, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to take my quick grip and I'm going to position it over just the front face. Now, what does that mean? That means that I'm going to line this jaw up so that it doesn't pass onto the bottom layer. It's only going to be compressing the top layer or the top half of plastic. So, ideally, what you want is you want that line to be visible, but just visible. So, when you compress this, It's only compressing the front half. So let me get that into position and we'll go on from there. Okay, that's it. So now let's take a look here. And as you can see, we've got our clamp in place with just a little tension and we have not w e n t over our dividing line boundary. We are not compressing the bottom, only the front. That's exactly what we want. And we want to make sure we check both sides here. So let's check this side and we're looking pretty good. So now the trick is. Is to just apply a little pressure, make a little compression. You're going to see this bow just a bit, and as it bows, we're going to help it along with our fingers by just separating the two pieces of plastic like this. So here's a little pressure. Just a little pressure is all it takes, and you might hear a pop. That's fine if you do. Just like that, lift the pressure off. Now, very carefully, we'll just pick this cartridge up. As you can see, we, we've separated the tabs, so we just need to be very careful. Bring this down. There's our circuit board, and our shell 
is absolutely unharmed. That is how you break down a Famicom cartridge. Now the hard part's really over. I mean, a lot of people, a lot of people really consider this to be the crux, and understandably so. Um, so many of these cartridges have been destroyed because people were just, you know, ripping them out, trying to figure out how to disassemble them. I hope that that helps you. Nonetheless, let's move into the circuit board and let's talk about what we need to do here. Now, just like Mother for the Famicom or Earthbound, if you have a repro copy for the NES, uh, this game uses a TK-ROM mainboard. Uh, that means it uses an MMC3 mapper, uh, and I believe this game specifically has a 2 megabit or a 256K prog data on the uh, prog ROM, and the graphical data takes up about, I think, a megabit uh, or 128 kilobytes of data. So we're going to remove the prog memory, the character memory, as well as a CR2032 battery uh, before we do anything else. It's just easier to get it all out of the way, so let's do that right now. Now, real quick before we move forward, in previous desoldering episodes, I've always talked about the importance of making sure that these pins have been broken up properly. And an easy way to do that is to either take your fingers and just wiggle down, make sure you're breaking up any residual solder that's lingering in those plated through holes, or you could use something like a pair of tweezers. I've done that, and now we're gonna do the good old fashioned finger test, which means we just flip this upside down, or upright again, and we'll just take our fingers and we'll just push. We'll just push to see if the ROM is coming out, and it is. And just like butter, oh, just like butter, oh, give me the butter, just like that. We've removed the prom here. Now we're going to move on to the character ROM, and we're going to do the battery. I'm going to speed this up again. Let's get it done. Okay, let's just loosen these up. You never want to rip these out. Okay, I think that's ready. Okay, and you know what we're going to do? We're actually going to set these to the side. We want to keep these. We always want to keep these. So move these over. Let's take the battery out. Now, when it comes to the battery, I just like to turn this over, heat each side, and pull the battery out. So let's do that. Now I'm going to be installing a battery coin cell holder. So what I like to do is, for the particular holder that I like to use, I'm gonna go ahead and flood these two pads for the battery leads. Now I'm going to take my battery holder and I'm just going to advance this in as I make the solder go molten, so let's do it. Okay, I'm going to anchor in the other side. Now the great thing about installing a coin cell battery holder is the fact that when a battery goes bad in another 10 or 15 years, it's really simple to just take a new battery, put it into position here, and just put it down. 
and it's it's really that simple. And I don't recommend this brand. That's just what I have. On, <laughs> that's just what I have on hand right now. But um, you know, and, and this battery holder has such a low profile that it will clear the plastic. So having said that, we're all finished up here. Let's now talk about programming our new prom chips that we're going to have to use, and let's get into all of that business. So let's go. Now, I apologize for the drop in audio quality, but we're now at the computer, and before we can get into the process of wiring up our replacement PROMs, we need to prep our files for writing to memory. Now, I'm sure all of you are enterprising enough to know where to find either a pre-patched English version of this game, or the Japanese ROM and IPS patch. I'm going to be applying a translation patch that I've created for my own personal amusement. After we apply this patch, we'll then split the ROM into corresponding PROG and CHAR files for writing. So the first thing that we need to do is we need to open Lunar IPS. Now this is software that allows you to apply IPS patches to ROM files. So let's open this up. I'm going to click Apply IPS Patch. And then I'm going to find the folder that has that patch, which is here. Here is the patch for Radia Senke. That's going to ask us to find the uh, ROM file itself. I'm just going to find the ROM here. Here's a Japanese copy. And that's it. The ROM has been patched. Now, the final step in prepping our game ROM is to split it into corresponding prog and character files so that these can be directly written to EEPROMs of our choosing. Now, writing these files to memory is very specific to the programmer that you're going to be using, so I won't be showing that. But going through these steps, your files will be ready to bring into whatever programming environment you may have or use. So to do this, I like to use a piece of software called Famirom. I'm just going to open this up here, and it's a nice GUI that does most of the heavy lifting for you. So the only thing that you really need to do here is just click open, select the ROM file that you want to split, and what's really nice about Famirom is it gives you a lot of nice information here. Um, the most important information to you, though, is the prog size and the character size. Now, I'm going to be using two 2 megabit PROMs for both the prog and the character sizes. So in order to do this, I just simply need to come down here and make sure that the 2 megabit or the 256K PROM is selected for the prog. And for the character, I need to make sure that I have the 2 megabit set here as well. And why is that? Well, just with the nature of the 6502 and its Indianness, or the way it addresses memory and locations, you need to fill and pad your space up. So if your ROM is larger than the actual size of the file that you'll be burning to it, pad it up until it's at full capacity. And the software does that for you, so it's really easy. Nonetheless, the only thing remaining is to click Split. Now, you don't get any kind of notification or anything like that. Um, where this file, where these two files are saved are in the ROM directory. So if we go over here and click ROM, we'll see that we have a uh, prog file and we also have a character file. Now both of these will be burned to two separate EEPROMs and naturally the prog file, this will be socketed into the prog location on that TK ROM board as well as the character ROM will be socketed to the character section of the TK ROM, ROM uh, main board. So that's all there is to this. We're done, we're ready to burn, let's get back to the board. Now we're back with our main board and we have programmed both of our prog and character PROMs. Now notice that my chips don't have windows that we would otherwise need to cover up. That's because these are electronically erasable program read-only memories and they're not UV PROMs, so we don't have to worry about that. But let's talk about where the fun really begins. Now I'm going to be showing you some of Voltar's sacred techniques. Because unfortunately, there's a lot of bad and often cringe-worthy advice out there on how one should construct a repro, especially when we're using a donor board like we are here. Now, I am not picking on people while showing you some examples of what not to do. That is not the point. Let's help people improve, and let's help people get better at this. That's the idea, and that's the goal. Now, the majority of Nintendo Mask ROMs, um, they don't adhere to the JDEC spec. Well, what does that mean? That simply means that EEPROMs and Nintendo Mask ROMs don't always share the same pinout. Uh, maybe three or four signals are different between uh, your, your 1 megabit or 2 megabit or even 4 megabit um, Nintendo Mask ROMs and real EEPROMs. This is where people run into trouble because you've got to rewire these. You've got to rewire these so they marry to the board appropriately. That's why things get messy. So having said that, I'm going to show you how I prep these. Now I'm not going to show the entire pinout here of both you know, the Mask ROM to EEPROM sort of conversion, but what I will do is link a really good article on Nestev 
that will simply show you all of the connections that I'm making. And the secret to this, guys, is really in the prep work. I do all the prep work on the chip. I never do any of the prep work on the main board. As a matter of fact, this, this really doesn't even come into play for anything. So we can just really set that to the side for now. So I'm going to bring this chip, pull it upside down like that. I'm going to show you how we do things downtown. Let's do it. Now I'm going to start with the EEPROM that holds the PROG data. And I want to flash a little graphic or picture up here that's just showing you all of the connections and modifications that I'm going to be making to these pins. So now that that's up on the screen, we're now ready to do this. I'm going to turn this chip upside down. I'm going to start lifting and straightening out the pins that need to be pulled out of circuit. And the wiring and conductor that I'll be using is just 30 aug kind R. That's the most ideal. Now I've pulled all of the pins that I need to out of circuit and I'm just going to trim the legs down. Okay, now that we've got the legs trimmed, I'm just going to gently pre-tin these legs now. Now that we have them pre-tinned, I'm going to start attaching conductors that are approximately three to four inches in length to each of our lifted pins. Fantastic. So we've got all of our conductors attached here to the legs that needed to be lifted out of circuit. And this is the part where we really start rewiring. So less talking, more working. Let's do it. Now real quick before I go on, um, all the documentation tells you just to lift pin 1 and leave it floating. That's generally a bad idea. Um, pin 1 is typically VPP or that's the, that's the pin that you have to hold high, usually between 8 and 12 volts to write to the chip. You should really never leave that floating. So either tie it to ground or either tie it to, um, either tie it to a voltage supply. I'm just going to tie it to 5 volts here which is going to be, uh, and, you know, in our case it's going to be pin 32. Uh, just verify that with the multimeter if you're doing this at home, but I'm just, I want to tie this, uh, I, wanna, I don't want to keep this pin floating. I don't want to keep that gate floating around, so I want to go ahead and uh, tie this high to 5 volts here, so back to it. Now that we have our wires in approximate position to where they need to be, we're ready to bring the mainboard in and we're ready to drop this dip 
and to the prog socket. So here we go. So remember this conductor here, this is hole two going to pin, or this is, I'm sorry, pin two going to hole 24 down here. So we just need to count to hole 24, which is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Right there. I'm just gonna go ahead and slack that wire through like so. Just like that, I'm just gonna push it down gently. Perfect. So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna do the rest. That's pin, well you really can't see this well, but this is pin 30 to hole one. So there's that, pin 30 going into hole one of the main board. Like so. some of the slack out of that. And we've got pin 31 going to hole 2. Just like that, which is address line 18. Okay. Oops. I'm going to pick this up and I'm just going to start pushing this in. I'm going to start grabbing them all and I'm going to start just pulling them in. Pulling them in. So, you can see the wire, see the preforming, how you preform these, it just makes your life so much easier because everything just falls into place. Great. Keep going. There we go. I'm going to pull just a little more. I'm going to come on this side. See how we're looking? We're looking fantastic. Let me just get these legs in there like that. Okay. Now let me come on this side. Give me just a second. I'm just a man. There we go. Now for some final tugs. I like to be tugged at night. Tell my ex-wife that. And that's it. This chip is in position. It's absolutely in position and we're in good order. So what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to flip this upside down and we're gonna we're gonna solder this in and then we're gonna solder our wires after we quickly sweep across this. So let's do it. Now, if you haven't figured it out yet, this is exactly how we are interfacing the pins of the EEPROM that we need to lift out a circuit to the holes on the mainboard. So what we're going to do now is I'm just going to cut our conductors that are poking through to the approximate nominal length of the EEPROM legs that poke through too. So just get it kind of flush like this, cut, and come over here to these two, and cut, just like that. Now we need to be very careful because we have to remove the insulation of our conductors. We have to attach the conductor to the actual plated through hole here. And to do that, I'm simply going to use the conical tip that you see in the frame here. We've got this nice zoomed in macro shot. I'm just going to do some small little ellipses around this jacket so that we can clean it off and we can attach it and we'll be done. That's perfect, we'll solder this in. Okay, we're halfway there. That was start to finish with the prog. Let's move on to the character memory. It's really the same process, let's do it.
just snug her down like that. Perfect alignment. Let's flip it around. Let's solder it in. And as always, I'm going to clean up my work with a little IPA and a toothbrush. Beautiful. And after all that hard work, at last we're done. This is it guys, we finished it. Um, one thing I did not show is I actually had to pull an address line high here, so there's a little solder bridge there between pins 31 and 32 of our character ROM, but otherwise, this is all done. Now naturally, before you go and you put this back together, put it in your Famicom before wrapping the casing back around this thing. Make sure it works, then do it. I've done that, let's put the case back together, let's try it out. Just like that, it's finished. All done. Let's give it a shot. And we'll very sensually put this in our twin Famicom and let it load. And there it is. Man, this game is such a jewel. A true classic, an underdog that never gets spoken about. I really don't understand why. Even for Tecmo, an RPG, phenomenal game. And I really hope you guys give it a shot. I really had fun. Um, you know, I've talked about doing some sort of reproduction video for a long, long time, and I, I hope some of these techniques really help you guys out there who like to make your own carts and you want to do a really clean job. Um, this is the best way to go, in my opinion. So having said that, I hope you enjoyed this. Um, ring that bell down below, give the video a like if you enjoyed it, subscribe if you haven't already, and we'll see you next time.